that you just mentioned, I just wanted to men mention Leslie Orgel, who is a giant in this field, and it's actually very, very hard to think of anything in this area, kind of, that Leslie hadn't thought about, or thought of in some way or other. And I think also as the theme of this morning session, I think I would like to quote uh, Orgel's second law, which is, evolution is smarter than you are. <laughs> <laughs> this is really nice, okay. Well, that's one question. I had a question for uh, Philippe Maria. An intellectually demanding question uh, for me. How do you know which mutations are adaptive or uh, relevant <coughs> when you have 6,000 mutations in your run one, 8,000 in run two? So one heuristics you actually propose in some way or suggested is to look at the overlap. So you do more experiments, look at the overlap. But if, you, if you have in the end 20 mutations that are overlapping, it doesn't mean that they are sufficient. So you could clearly put them in a new strain and see how it goes, but you probably require some of the other mutations <coughs> that are found within the 8,000 or 6,000. Do you have other heuristics to find which are adaptive or relevant? I, uh, I completely agree with you. We are so happy to see that many mutations. You know why? Because we thought of referees if you find only 15 adaptive mutations, they are going to ask you, you know, to take each of them and put that in a separate stream. Six thousand, you know, no journal ever nasty and francophobic and whatever will ever ask you. You, you must have found ones that made some sense, though. DNA yes. binding proteins, yeah, yeah. da 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 da. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. The, the replication apparatus is under fire. RNA polymerase is under fire. Uh, uh, the repair system is mostly in, in, uh, noble enzymes of nucleic acid, uh, but not so much uh, nucleotide metabolism. Even uh, there is thymidine kinase also is a, is a target of uh, mutation. So HNL and other proteins that bind DNA. Uh, well, so, some of them are yes, yes, but. Uh, um, a polymerase, the, uh, and in, in each lineage we, we find that polymerase. Now, to, 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 uh, I don't think that we are going to, uh, to really study, uh, because in a, in, in a, in a uh, trajectory like that, you find interesting things all along the way, but uh, our main target is to really leave the solar system, so to speak. All five polymerases, or just I'm sorry? all five, or just three? Uh, mutations? All three, yeah. Did we no, 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 it's in the, you, more than that, you have uh, now uh, up to uh, 10 mutations in a uh, polymerase. It's keep, no, in all five, in how many different plum races? Like just pull three or no, pull one and three? No, no, several. I think it's three uh, out of the five, yes. There's a question. Can I have the question? I think that uh, maybe one has to go from the chemostat or better from the torpostat to a cladostat. Because I think uh, uh, this is clear that a gradient, especially spatial gradients, some parts of it might be ice and some parts might be not ice. That means we can, then we get coexistence via niche effects. And, and this creates a lot of interesting uh, of patterns. And I, uh, especially, you show that picture there. It's very familiar to me there if you have really environment involved then you get crazy patterns. Yes, there are also uh, <coughs> unexpected uh, uh, ways of helping evolution. For instance, if having predation. You know, if you have predators, you have okay. faster even in a, in a completely orthogonal way. So. <coughs> yes, uh, you po pointed out an uh, interesting situation where the direction of mutation went differently after you uh, finished the initial adaptation phase. Uh, so you went A to G in one culture and yes. G to A in the other yes. culture. Mm -hmm. uh, could that be explained by the acquisition of a specific mutator uh, mutation in one of the two lineages? We, we actually we, uh, we, we tried to, uh, to see whether there was such a pattern and we did not find any. So there is no clear... Uh, and actually, it's um, it's hard because it's as a sudden, you know, as soon as it was in un only accelerating, and uh, the division generation time was no longer imposed, it has to. We, we we saw this trend from the from the at the the turn of the evolution evolutionary regime. Clearly, we we really don't understand that. Um, so I, I had a question actually about 
on the transcription side, so you have mispairing, but it's yep. also possible. I was curious if you saw more mutations in the transcripts, but also how you would be able to tell that it's from the RT and so on. We, we, we had mutations in the RPOS and you know the transcription machine or in, a, in, a, in RNA polymerase. Now you no longer have Tata box but clack clack box and stuff like that. So RNA polymerase has to adapt to that, but we did not do uh, a, a thorough uh, transcript, transcription uh, analysis of the, along the, the evolutionary process. So we don't know. I was wondering how much the cell uh, remains able to, uh, to execute uh, other program, for instance a phage or something like that. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, they, they are really, no, since they are always growing, they no longer have a stationary phase, you know, so, uh, so long, uh, you can freeze and thaw so them okay, but you cannot just, you know, E. coli is uh, probably is the model organism because you can just let it on the bench for the weekend, and then you come uh, back on Monday morning and you can start, uh, you know, resume your experiment. Now it's, they die uh, very, very quickly. Uh, and they, <coughs> so everything that is, that is not to be maintained during the evolutionary process is lost. So, uh, phages, uh, they are less uh, sensitive to, I think, T7, and uh, T7 was tested, and it, the T7 seems not to uh, infect it as well as uh, previously, as a white type. A yeah, kind of overlapping question about the genetic stability of these mutations. How stable they are? And if they can well, well, well. Um, they, 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 they are like they have. Uh, as far as we can uh, study, because it's difficult to just have an isolated uh, strain from that and study it, uh, because they die out and so on. So we have problems of reproducibility, but we don't know whether it's purely phenotypic because they they, they die or whether it's genetic. We believe we don't have indication that. Uh, they have uh, they are very very mutator for instance they are steadily mutator of uh, the accumulate of the order of one mutation per cell per generation which is high enough because we will reach uh, salmonella in the uh, foreseeable future and so on but uh, I mean I, but that's what we can say please so I, I don't maybe this is um, so as I understood yesterday's talk you're looking for new pairs that are stable. That's part of the yep, yep. criteria you're looking for. Yep. What if you look for ones that were stable? You'd have to do a co-selection on mm -hmm. A and B or X and Y, whatever we call it. Um, but w w where this, the cross hybridization with the naturals are not stable, you, you could enforce speciation. And absolutely, definitely, and that's actually one of the <coughs> uh, one of the nice. Uh, uh, goals to, to consider is to try to affect speciation through exactly yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's very tiny. Yeah, I have also a question. Sorry, <laughs> <you feel. laughs> Now you, your turn is coming. In, in your evolutionary biology, it's very, it's very often the case that if you have these alternating environments, that you get special phenotypes that, that allow themselves to adapt this by switching <coughs> and bed hatching. Do you see that? Uh, I cannot say that we have uh, that we have uh, all other uh, media in which we could uh, test them and so on. We did not. Uh, we we saw that they were very very unfit, and we, we don't have. Uh, we, 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 I don't think that we can answer this question so far. You mentioned the uh, thymine became toxic. Yes. Um, have you considered uh, running your experiments in backwards? Universe? Yes. Actually, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, know, you see that uh, the cock wheels are uh, turning in the right direction in your audience when people ask this question. I don't think that we are far enough. I mean, at the beginning, you know, we would put it on the, on thymine and see. A river, reversion mutant pop, pop up, they no longer pop up. So uh, we are not far enough, I think. But time will come and we will definitely do that. I think you just pick up too many compensatory mutations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it just becomes a yes. one way street. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Question for Phil, how are you? you? You rightfully pointed out the importance of uh, local concentration effects in, uh, in these uh, stories and scenarios. Um, I was wondering whether it has been explored that um, small oligonucleotides that have the possibility to pave a surface or a volume would uh, allow for uh, the concentration of 
other or same oligonucleotides that would have some catalytic catalysis properties and uh, would at the same time protect them from dilution. Yeah, I think surface effects have been explored by, by some people, but simply by tethering oligonucleotides. And yes, obviously you can then go through um, concentration and wash cycles <coughs> and you know you can overcome product inhibition to some some extent. Um, one of the problems of coupling things to surfaces is that at some point you know things need to come off the surface again. Um, so you need to have some sort of regime which will um, then strip the surface so the cycle can start again. Um, we haven't explored that, but um, yeah, some people like Von, von Kiedrowski, for example, has, has looked at things like that. And certainly there's also um, simulations which show that um, you need compartmentalization for the, as a prere prerequisite for Darwinian evolution, but under certain circumstances, just local surface patchiness might be enough to, to isolate, for example, a replicator from parasites. So yeah, I mean these are these are interesting ideas, but we have not explored. Yet. Phil, I have a related question. Just a very nice talk. And uh, did you ever check the P whether pH changes also play an effect in these protected phases? Yeah, yeah, we because have, we it's known that the ice crystallization or during crystallization, certain, for example, in the lab buffer components. We crystallize uh, later or um, earlier, and then this might affect then the pH in these new phases. Yeah, yeah. The the, the pH changes by about 0.5, depending on the buffer. Um, uh, it changes by about 0.5 units. But when we, ex you know, when we try to compensate for that, literally nothing changes. So I think the pH change is not the dominant effect we observe. I think the dominant effects are the temperature change the concentration, mm -hmm. and possibly, although this is very hard to to prove, the surface effects um, of the ice crystals, because the, there's a very, very large surface that is generated as the, as the ice crystals grow. Okay. <coughs> so, um, we were just discussing, what historically uh, was the temperature situation back in the day, and and uh, also related to that, I assume most of the ice is salt water ice. So, are your conditions closer to what you would have by freezing salt water ice or fresh water ice? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. This. Okay. So the first question I I can't answer, and neither can anybody else, because I think there's no rocks surviving from the very early days on Earth. I think their estimates kind of based on so-called circum inclusions which give you only very average temperature temperatures but I believe the consensus although I'm on thin ice there because I'm not a, uh, a geophysicist I believe the consensus is that the planet acquired a hydrosphere very quickly and cooled to about a global temperature of approximately 40 degrees within the first um, hundred million years so um, Assuming that, and actually the fact that this, the solar output was only about 70% of, of today, I think it's certainly not far-fetched to propose um, ice maybe at the poles or seasonal kind of at higher elevations. I mean, I, I would say, but you know, it's impossible to be totally certain about that. Um, I think the conditions <coughs> of our assays are mostly compatible with freshwater ice. Um, and what you'd find is that the high salt concentrations that you'd find in, um, in sea ice are mostly incompatible with not just nucleotide chemistry but also assembly of membranes or uh, uh, generation of amino acids. So I think all of the sort of most credible scenarios for generating these things need to take place. Uh, I think outside the ocean. I think there is some chemistry which has been proposed to occur at these various kind of various types of hot vents, but it's not it's not necessarily you know you don't necessarily have to have the origin of life where you you know, make all the stuff. I think you know I, I think these some of these chemistries kind of are okay as foundries, sort of where you assemble all the bits that you need to build the car. But I think the car needs to be built in a in a more benign environment. <coughs> 
in the beginning of your talk, you showed this nice picture of uh, Campbell's primordial soup. So, uh, <laughs> uh, do you have any idea how diverse this soup must be bef before the so the auto assembly thing of your? Uh, oh, um, yeah, I, I'm not a I'm I'm not, I'm not a um, prebiotic chemist, so. Um, I think there's various various people have uh, advanced various scenarios, but there is now a number of um, I think very credible studies which um, which yield, as I said, a number of amino acids and lipids, and certainly some of the nucleotides from things like um, uh, uh, HCN, so um, and cyanogens and uh, acetylene. So basically, um, highly reduced. Uh, components which you find, um, which which um, which I think which you find, for example, in comets and and in outer space, highly abundant. So presumably, given the probably um, almost incessant bombardment from outer space on the early Earth, certainly these these molecules would have been present. But um, this is sort of outside my my expertise a little bit. I mean, I, what I would say is that there's credible scenarios to take you to nucleotides. Um, some other people, uh, for example, Chuck Shostak and David Diemer and others have, have shown some credible pathways to go from nucleotides to oligomers, and, and really kind of this is where, 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 where our work would start. But uh, presumably, you, you with this free store cycle, you would create different combinations of oligomers uh, every time, so mm -hmm. uh, you, you would need some <coughs> minimum amount of diversity, I think, to start with. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't know actually. I mean, I think that's a very good question. What would be the minimum amount of diversity that you would need to start with through iterative recombination to build up a sufficient uh, diversity from which uh, phenotypes could emerge? I think these are these are open questions. I really don't know the answer to that. Because there's a related question in your abstract, you mentioned the thing that it might be an, uh, an accidental uh, freezing of, uh, of the, the actual set of... Uh, uh, yeah, I think with the, the, the frozen accident refers to the chemistry, not yeah. so much to, to, <laughs> to, 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 to the process. To the process, I mean, I think, I think, well, this is, I mean, you know, again, like everything to do with the origin of life, this is controversial, mm -hmm. but I believe that the chemistry of life is built, is basically opportunistic. So life got started with building blocks that were abundantly there, given by Earth's prebiotic chemistry. And once you've made that choice, it's very hard to change. Uh, as Philippe has shown, it takes, takes a could, lot. Could you, get, could you <coughs> use this idea to get something going in synthetic gravity, that's right? Um, well, I mean, I think, um, as, I sh as I've shown, in principle, <coughs> there, is, there is probably a number um, of backbones, of polymers, that are capable of of uh, heredity, sort of uh, genetic information storage, propagation and evolution, um, and certainly, probably, you know, not just backbones, as we've shown yesterday, as we've seen yesterday, there are probably different, you know, base pairing schemes to encode information as well. So I would say there is a large but finite number of ways to store and replicate information, and so I think in time we might be able to explore it. Just, just to be clear about that, to my knowledge, there still only is one biopolymer that's capable of amplification and heredity, and that's DNA. No, no thio DNA for prime thio DNA is also able to. Okay, okay, but 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 that's what you enough, talked right? about still well, uses RNA. There's RNA viruses. They yes. clearly are capable yeah. of heredity and evolution. Okay, so RNA in, in, in DNA predominantly RNA in some cases, yeah. but just. Yeah. For the language to be clear, yeah. I, I, I think you should be careful about calling those genetic systems and inher in, in heritability because you still you are using the DNA and the amplification. Yeah. And the amplification I, is a huge component of No, that. no, I agree. I, I don't call them genetic systems, but I think heredity as a process of information storage and propagation is a, is a nice... Is a nice sort of short form of kind yeah, of saying. Well, at some point, things become short enough that people misunderstand them. Uh, okay. true, true, well, but, fair enough. Yeah, but uh, uh, XNA polymerase, XNA dependent, it's only a matter of time. Sure, but but, <coughs> but it does require. But it's not yet here. Right. What's that? <coughs> it is, they are not yet available, but uh, there is. A, oh, I will not ask the question when they are. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, uh, perhaps I wanted to make a comment about uh, you know spontaneous evolvability and so on. Uh, you know, uh, 
you, 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 you find, you read it very often, you know, people like to see uh, star evolution, hmm. then chemical evolution, then biological evolution, as if it was a single process. And uh, presumably it's not true. Uh, when uh, heredity kicks in, you have completely different regime, including generating people who think like us, and we can transform and morph completely things. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in terms of um, implementation in synthetic biology, I would advocate for going as artificial and improbable and non-spontaneous as we can, and not the other way around. Uh, for uh, for uh, setting up life, you know, start again, because actually it's a, the specification that you have to respect is enormous if you really want to close the gap between uh, some chemicals or ribose or whatever and real life or evolving system you have to not only it's a matter of chemical design but you have to to to, to follow this uh, all the continuity of these logical steps which is uh, daunting right? now uh, with organic chemistry you can simplify a lot of things because you can uh, arrange uh, design systems so in uh, non aqueous solvents and so on and, um, and implementation might not have all these constraints of uh, continuity and uh, logical uh, design stepwise perhaps we can make big jumps Dr. Mark in the back and so you engineered E. coli um, with a new methionine uh, metabolism and it had the single growth rate after 40 days I was just wondering if you mix that population with the white type, what would happen? Would it auto complete? Would there be yeah. two populations in at the same time? Actually, uh, one of these lineages was um, was evolved long enough, you know, in turbidosite, it was done in, in Berlin by uh, Rupert Nielsen. And actually, uh, at the end of the evo evolutionary process, in turbidosite, he, he, he made competitions with the uh, wild type and it grew faster. But of course, it was uh, not such a demonstrative experiment because we he did not uh, adapt wild type E. coli under the same conditions, so it should be the outcome of the same competition independently to measure that uh, I tried to, uh, to, 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 to uh, allude to that uh, earlier with this uh, Turing test, you know. Uh, it is confronting adaptive challenges that we can uh, that we can really measure the improvement in evolvability and so on. Uh, but such experiments, this is the future, uh, you, you are right. But uh, at this stage, and these machines are not too costly, but we have a limited number of them. The first objective is to go to reach the, the outskirts of uh, Mother Nature ASAP, and then we will play competition uh, games and stuff. But we are not yet there. And we have, it's a matter of uh, resource uh, allocation and so on. About, about this Turing test, there is something um, so the Turing like test as, as, as a fellow of human. Uh, um, uh, yeah, but it's a. Uh, that be a na natural. Uh, well, uh, as, as I said, then you can use competitions. You know, you can uh, adapt uh, uh, Freud's strain and put it in a uh, in competition with uh, evolve it so that uh, the basis feel good uh, invade the genome uh, for a short while do the same with Ishiro's uh, strain then put them in competition at some point you know this kind of experiment there will be different among the different bases that you mentioned you could put the bases in competition for invasion of ecola you know you, the races are not only uh, between organisms but you could make you could use organisms to sort out the, the benefits, the chemical, or the functional benefits of different bases as well. Actually, I'd like to invite some some uh, contribution from the audience uh, of this idea of the, on the Turing test. Has anyone <coughs> thought about when we decide that synthetic biology has become uh, real biology or something? <laughs> it is real biology. <laughs> <laughs> So we don't need a test. No, it just depends what you're interested in. If you're interested in solving a specific question, then one, 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 can, one can do that. I mean, I think what we're, what we're referring to here is how do you tell whether something's gotten as good as nature produced? Yes. So situation reminds me very, very much to the problems you may have to do with uh, uh, designing new algorithms if you want to sell it to yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, industries. They say, we know yours is better, but we know ours 
to implement that costs a lot of money, and we know what it makes wrong. But we do not know what your scheme makes wrong. This maybe is an obstacle. Life is mm -hmm. algorithmic chemistry, definitely. And so you, you can, you can uh, when you, you talk with computer scientists about this kind, they, they see uh, Orgesa <coughs> as a competing program, you know, competing programs. And you, I think it's, it's very pertinent, uh, this way of looking. Now, uh, you can do that in silico, the kind of computing that you, that you have, uh, uh, and the, the evolutionary process itself as a kind of statistical programming and so on, we don't master formally. But, can I just, I mean, you're obviously uh, pushing very hard on this idea of completely synthetic life and building new yes. chemistries and new algorithms yeah. and new solutions to what we, what we have now. Mm -hmm. How do you think society and the public would think about that? <laughs> because uh, it's okay in this room where we're all kind of scientists and researchers. Don't tell anyone, yes. There might be a bit of a problem going oh, yes, to the commission and saying, we're going to make life that you've never seen before. Yeah, I know. even following the rules of life. Yes, you know, no, you, are, you, are, so, you are so right. I don't know. But you know, people, you I look at domestic animals, you know, they like them. And you see uh, this uh, Charolais uh, cattle, they look so happy. They are completely, uh, they are genetic uh, variants. You know, we have uh, morph them. Well, yeah, but they, they, they no longer look like morox or stuff, right? Okay, but and like so we would like to make uh, uh, them like xenobiology creatures, like they, they like their pets. You know, pets are horrible genetic monsters. And you think, uh, is it? Okay. No? But uh, I, I totally agree with you that it will be super... I mean, we are thinking of having this, you know, big European, uh, um, big European, uh, you know, like the brain, uh, the graphene, and say, larger than life, you know. So we are going to uh, use everything, all competencies, uh, uh, all kind of different uh, skills and so on, so as to, you know, make a, a second nature that will be very respectful, of course, of everything, uh, even the gender, scene. Things and stuff, and uh, but but completely artificial, so as to help the industry. But I think it's it's, it's easy to convince technocrats of that, but the public is just. Um, and I, I think maybe I mean to me the most interesting thing in varying the chemistry is to understand what what makes what makes the chemistry of life special, potentially, or not, or not, or not, or not. Or not. yeah. So I have a question about your Turing test uh, analogy. Uh, so you said something about, you know, once we get to a certain point, we have to contain things ironclad way. But I, it wasn't clear to me, I mean, if you, if, you, if you select for something that has a gain of function that outperforms wild type, and you've been doing that for a long time, right? But almost every time when you do that, and then you test them under some other fitness condition, mm -hmm. It, it never never can compete with the wild type. So is this really a problem? Yes, I think it is. You know, you, you remember Jurassic Park, you know, life finds a way, <laughs> right? And uh, you know, for Laura Yoracil, you, <laughs> uh, you know, I would not, I mean, I would not bet on the fact that E. coli will never find a way to make Laura Yoracil and become prototrophic again. You know, if you treat with hypochlorite, uh, cytosine, or whatever, you get chlorouracid in the juice or with uh, some uh, chloroperoxidase and stuff. So uh, I think chlorouracid is accessible, it, it's within reach. So if we think along this line uh, and we, we want to contain organism, we will have to go a long way. It's not going to be <coughs> easy. And uh, scientifically, it's going to be very demanding, actually, to get to a stage where we can make sure that there are something like 10 to the power 30 genomes at work, at work, cellular genomes, at work on Earth. Well, that's, that's big. That's not that big. So we might be clever enough to find chemistries that the whole biosphere could not uh, 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 tame or uh, master itself. It, uh, I think it's a big issue to go in the... Um, um, chemical uh, reprogramming of life beyond the search that the biosphere alone is able to do. But of course, I'm, this is a bit, I'm expressing <coughs> it in a, a bit, po I know that I'm here in a mathematical um, institution, uh, an eminent one, right? It's a question for mathematicians. How can we measure the search, or what is searchable by the biosphere, and with our little knowledge, skills, and whatever, uh, 
how can we say at this point there will be no way of um, uh, having uh, spontaneous evolution make uh, these Jurassic uh, uh, Jurassic Park monsters of ours? But isn't that also an, or not only a question, also a question of the conditions that, uh, that it, uh, life evolves into? Uh, it's, it's also about what you're doing is creating artificial conditions that life may adapt to, and that sort of that, that it didn't have the, the need before to go there. That's right. But we should not be too optimistic of the fact that they are de-evolved, de so that they have, a, they were just in some uh, uh, plumbery, and that they will never readapt to the to the to the wild world. We don't know. We must be pessimistic about this. So it seems that there is a, a, another strategy to uh, to reach a bit of single, which is not to change the chemistry, but to change something else that's uh, concerned with life, uh, for example, Definitely. genetic code. And so can, can you comment on, on, on that? Do you think you can really reach the same level of... Uh... We, you know, proliferation is serious business. You know, when you have cattle fed with beef, you get prions in the cycle. So proliferation, when you have, uh, when you have uh, uh, proliferative uh, uh, latency, Having a cycle, a nutritional cycle, and so on, will lead to proliferation and improvement by natural selection. We saw it in uh, many infectious diseases, prions, and so on. So whatever, I think it's a matter of, of uh, nutrition for uh, containing, because if it is only a matter of uh, auto, um, any entity that is able to take things, to assemble them, and proliferate, if it can find them or uh, in the... Um, in the wild, or make them through some chemical metabolic reactions, it will invade its environment. This Darwinian selection. Okay. So to prevent that, even if we have different genetic codes and so on, it will not be enough. We have to prevent their material proliferation. So we have to make them absolutely dependent on nutrients that they cannot find or make. I think it's at least it's a so it's a question chemically that is very well stated. They must not find their nutrient. Otherwise, we will have prey on life, whatever. And we have to be super pessimistic about it. Not say they are, uh, they will, life will find a way. I, I, I tend to, for myself, I tend to come down more on, on this side. That, um, <coughs> that I think that, and related to the question that came up yesterday, sort of what new activities, looking at the case of proteins, could we evolve? I think those would be very specific activities that you chose specifically for a certain goal, like a therapeutic activity or something. And I think for the, the notion, the, the question as to whether or not something could grow to dominate in the wild, um, I, I'm not sure that anything that, that at least that as I look at it, um, there's anything out there that is going to make things grow faster or be more adaptable in general. Nitrogen fixation is a shame. You know, it's one of my favorite stances. Is the, I show you metabolic pathways. So I some of them are nice, some of them are just... Yeah. So I think there shame. are some pathways so you could, that you can engineer where the argument changes then. If you the nitrogen fixation, if you make it easy, you know, uh, and if uh, it is made in the, in the common genetic language, it will spread out. Well, so, okay, no? so you'd have to have specifically the ability to fix nitrogen contained to one... Um, Selectable thing. Yes, but uh, there is such an incentive evolution. You know, need nitrogenase and so on. There are probably other ways to do. Nature has found this one. Uh, there are many chemical reactions very easy in the, in the industry that life has not found yet. So introducing such capabilities like metathesis or stuff like that, you, you, you might provide incredible incentives in terms of selection in metabolism. Okay, the last question for oh, sorry, is more <coughs> a question, but more was a remark. We, we have been discussing yesterday uh, 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 the modularity. Yeah. I think we have to take into account not just the chemistry. We have a lot of also on molecular level biomechanics, and the signaling is getting more and more important. We have to understand it better. Therefore, it's, I'm not against biochemistry, but the, I only in the opposite. <coughs> but we should not forget there's more behind. <coughs> it's especially biomechanics and motility of species.
speed is a very important part which you cannot catch with a common sense. <coughs> well, when you look at a ribosome, it does very fine-tuned, superb chemistry, but you can also see this as a yes. mechanic, uh, yes, robotic uh, thing. Yes, but that's so not... I think it's, it's, a, it's the, a mixture. The, yes, it, the fields are not so well separated. It's not separated, exactly, but, I, but from a, I'm coming from a modeling side there, it's overlooked. We look too much at the chemical reaction system, not taking into account biomechanics, which is an important feature of, of, of structure formation. Yes, but empirically, making covalent bonds is what, what we master best. As uh, seen from uh, very far away, the, we are very good at them. And you heard yesterday uh, these uh, this talks about uh, uh, elaborating completely based pairs. It is miracles. So we, we, we know and, and engineering biomechanics and at the same level and doing physics in the same way would be much more difficult, I think, with the current knowledge that we have. Okay, with this, I'd like to thank both speakers again. <coughs>